Welcome, everybody. Thank you very much for joining us. You'll notice we are in a slightly different place today. We thank you for indulging us in our change of venue. I can't wait to introduce our guest to you. Uh, before we do, I want to let you know that you are watching Truer MU, and I want to let you know what that is. Truer MU is a video channel in which we talk about the truth about music and about other things, including writing and different careers. Uh, we are trying to educate, inform, and inspire you, and we hope you enjoy what you see. We certainly do our best to bring you some of the most interesting people you have ever met. And that being said, let me tell you a little bit about my guest and how I came to interview her today. My guest is someone who, like many of my guests, attended Oberlin College at the same time I did, but as opposed to most of my guests, I have never met this person. We were there at the same time, but we never knew each other, never met. The reason I know about our guest today is because a friend of mine had a junior composition recital and she shared that recital. And so years ago, I heard her music and thought, wow, this is interesting stuff. This is neat that I got to hear this other music. And then over the course of time, her name started coming up more and more as she became more and more well-known as a composer. And uh, it only took me a little while before I decided I really needed to meet this person and talk to her. So let me tell you about Arlene Sierra. Arlene Sierra is a London-based American composer whose music is lauded for its highly flexible and distinctive style, ranging from exquisiteness and restrained power to combative and utterly compelling. Her work has been commissioned and performed by countless orchestras and ensembles, and her awards include the Takemitsu Composition Prize, a Charles Ives Fellowship from the American Academy of Arts and Letters, PRS Composers Fund and Women Make Music Award, and the Leverholm Research Fellowship. Sierra's orchestral showpiece Muller was nominated for a Latin Grammy for Best Contemporary Classical Composition, and her music is the subject of a series of portrait recordings by the esteemed Bridge Records label. Arlene Sierra, welcome to our show. Thank you. I'm so glad you're here. It's nice to meet you, finally. Yeah, nice to meet you. I had no idea you were at my junior recital. <laughs> I wasn't at your recital. Or was it? No, I wasn't. I wasn't. I got a tape from David. Oh, really? Jared. Yes, because I missed his recital and he sent me a tape. And Right, okay. <laughs> or maybe I was at the recital. I don't know. In any case, it was the tape that I had that had your pieces on it. Right, wow. So, yeah, really interesting. Um, the first question I want to ask you, uh, you have said that when you were a young person, you didn't even know there were living composers and you only discovered that when you went to college. What does it mean to be a professional composer? Oh, God. Um, if anyone had told me, I'm not sure. <laughs> um, well, I, I, it, there's a lot of time spent just uh, telling people what being a composer is. Um, I think... Uh, you know, most of us who are interested in any kind of classical music think of composers as people, as men with powdered wigs who write on long curling manuscript paper with a feather pen. Um, and of course, when you learn a little bit more about music, you know that classical music continued well past the classical period, you know, through romantic, 20th, romantic and 20th century, post-romantic, modernism, all the move movements that you know from other art forms happened in classical music too. And uh, there are composers who have worked in all those styles. And when I started to learn that, and when I finally did see a few living composers walking around, uh, professors at Oberlin and, and uh, people at concerts that I went to in New York, uh, it really shifted my perspective. And it got me very excited because I really, uh, before having those encounters, I really thought the only kind of living artists were visual artists. And uh, to find out that there were, were people just as creative as the visual artists in music got me very inspired. And I think that's what, what got me my start, really. Did you consider becoming a visual artist? Uh, no, <laughs> because my mother is a visual artist. Um, and she, she uh, had... As I was growing up, I could see she had all those skills of drawing and sculpture and painting and, you know, all these incredible things that I wasn't, yeah, I mean, you know, I could draw little things, but my my realm was the piano. And I started playing the piano at the age of five. And so I had the sense that I was the musician of the family um, while they're, my mother and my sister are in visual art. So um, I knew music was my realm, but what I didn't know until I got to Oberlin was that people could be just as creative with music. Huh. So when you were playing piano, you were not yet making up music at five or six years old? 
Well, that's the funny thing. You know, I, I was. I improvised a lot. Um, and I would hear something when we were out and I would go home and improvise um, and do that. Um, but then my piano teacher started giving me really good, very challenging repertoire by Beethoven and Mozart without getting the theory to back that up. So I had no idea how that music was made. I just felt very in awe of it and motivated to learn how to play well enough to play that. Um, but it really kind of cut short my interest in composition and um, improvisation at that point because the things I wanted to play, I didn't know how they worked and I didn't know how to improvise in that way. Um, so it was a long hiatus, really, uh, between my creativity of performer developing and then discovering that actually that could be a ton of creativity and composition. Do you remember the kind of improvisations you used to do when you were a child? And when when did this stop? What, what, how old were you, would you say, when this happened? Uh, well, it's not that I never improvised again. I mean, I I had a, a band in my teens, and I used to do kind of fun chord progressions for them to play around with and things like that. I mean, I I, I was really interested in musical materials. Um, but I, I realized in retrospect that I wish I'd had a theory teacher alongside my piano lessons. Um, and, you know, my teachers were, you know, they did their best and they were good traditional piano teachers, but they didn't really have that. Um, so, yeah, I think, you know, the more you know about the materials, the more creative you can be. And, but it also had to do with not having heard any 20th century music. I think, you know, if you don't hear music from your own time, it's very hard to understand how you can be creative in that medium. And, and that was a different thing from my experience of visual art. I was seeing new visual art all the time because my mother was making it and having uh, shows and I, we were going to museums and exhibits and Museum of Modern Art in New York, you know, so I had such a sense of what art had done, you know, up to my lifetime. Um, but it took going to Oberlin to get that from the musical standpoint. Well, before we go to Oberlin, I'm just a little curious. Do you remember whether the kind of music you were improvising when you were younger was something like what you create now? Not really. I mean, I think it was sort of like discovering that I loved a certain key or a certain mode and playing around with that. Um, okay. And yeah, I see that that excites my beginning composition students now. You know, that's that's a great thing. It's a great place to start. And certainly that can lead you right into jazz and or into you know, a certain type of tonal compositions. Um, but for me, in terms of the really kind of cutting edge, really pushing boundaries kind of creativity that again was so obvious in visual art is sort of the, the uh, musical equivalent of abstraction. It took a lot more exposure and skill to be able to grapple with that. Um, and, and a lot more listening, you know, we don't hear that kind of music every day the same way that you would hear any number of the tonal genres. So so I would say my music is post-tonal now and maybe quite instinctively I hit some walls in my improvisation because I got kind of bored. You know, I I you know it was great to have theory classes as an undergrad and learn about modal mixtures and, and you know sort of post-tonal ways of of composing. But you know as a kid, unless you have somebody to tell you what that's about, it's kind of hard to figure it out. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, before uh, you, I happen to know from researching you that you went to Yellowstone Park at age eight, and I want to uh, know. Where did you find that? Oh my goodness. I don't know where I found that. I just do know right. that. Yeah. <laughs> and you, um, your mother is a painter, and you also are interested in Georgia O'Keeffe, and I think that was true when you were younger. You you seem to know a lot about art. Uh, was there definitely was there an interest, if not in knowing how to compose at that point, was there an interest in nature and the kind of things you compose about now, was that interest in you as a younger person? Yeah, I mean, I I think that's something very innate in children and young people and in all of us, you know, I mean, you know, I I was a kid in, in the suburbs climbing tr the very tops of trees and swaying in the breeze, you know, like my house was on a lake, you know, and I was constantly swimming. I had a kind of, outdoorsy upbringing in a lot of ways before my family relocated to New York City. Um, so, 
But through painting, absolutely. I mean, I saw so much great painting uh, as I was growing up. And so a sense of kind of understanding nature and, and materials. I mean, in terms of 20th century art, just, you know, seeing pieces made of wood, made of metal, made of sand and branches. My mother made these incredible paintings with branches stuck to the canvas and stuff. I think these, these things really uh, influenced me in a way that I wasn't really conscious of. Um, and then, of course, there, there's so much stunning pastoral kind of music that I, I loved as a young person. Um, so, I mean, you know, anyone who likes Beethoven, you know, they probably like the Fifth or the Ninth Symphony best. But for me, it was always the pastoral. <laughs> for I sure. that with you, um, yeah. You know, it, it just pieces that had bird song. I mean, I heard Messiaen at a pretty young age, too. Um, oh. I didn't know he was a living composer for some of that time, actually. Um, and uh, so things that used bird song were interesting to me pretty early on before I started doing when did you did you decide to become a composer before you got to Oberlin College? No. Um, what led me to go to a place like Oberlin, which very uniquely has a liberal arts college joined to a conservatory of music. I was, you know, one of the few really serious musicians in my high school. I played piano. I played competitions. I did all the sort of grades in piano. Um, and I knew that music was really important to me. I just, but I knew, I, you know, I had a sense that I wasn't concert, you know, pianist level. I mean, I was pretty good, but I wasn't that kind of Olympic athlete sort of good, but I wanted to be somewhere where music was a serious endeavor and to keep studying piano, even though I wanted to do a liberal arts degree. So Oberlin was the perfect place to go for that. And then going through the course catalog, um, I, you know, for my first classes, I saw that they offered uh, courses in electronic music. And I was really excited about that because I played keyboards and rock bands as a high school kid and loved making sounds on this old synthesizer. I really, you know, had fun with that sort of thing. So to imagine getting college credit to do that. <laughs> I just love uh -huh. that idea. <laughs> so I signed up for the sort of electronic music 101 class and was amazed and slightly terrified to find that the first assignment was to make a piece. Um, so that's where I really did my first fixed compositions. Uh, I was 18 or 19 years old doing an undergrad, you know, intro class. Um, and I loved it so much that I ended up adding the electronic music uh, degree in addition to my liberal arts degree. So, I, oh, so you were double degree? Yeah, another crazy double degree person. <laughs> right. What was the other degree? In? Uh, in East Asian studies. So <laughs> it was sort of um, um, uh, history, uh, art history, and religion and language kind of compilation of Chinese and Japanese cultural studies. Uh, I hope you don't mind my asking this question, and I hope my audience doesn't mind either, because... There is a piece on your junior recital that stuck with me and because it used this sample of somebody saying, and I beat him to a pulp and I swallowed him with one deep gulp. <laughs> and that, I don't know where that's from. Like I can't, I Googled it and I can't, what is that? <laughs> yeah, so when I was doing my first electronic pieces, I the thing I loved best was music concrete and putting together these kind of sample compilation tape loop sorts of pieces um, and I loved combining sort of clips of sounds from from life like door slamming and you know kind of <laughs> things from the world with car engines and things like that and people sort of speaking spoken word kind of stuff with snippets of things from the media or from classical repertoire um, sort of little bits and pieces of things sort of put together in kind of a sound installation sort of piece. And that particular very erudite quote was from a Sylvester and Tweedy uh, kind of Christmas jingle thing I found where <laughs> Sylvester's talking about all the terrible things he wants to do to Tweedy and then they, I think they sing together, but we're friends for Christmas. I don't remember where I found this thing, but oh. and as I had friends who were at the Oberlin radio station who had access to all these 
hilarious uh, public service announcements and old advertisements and things. So I raided some of their collections for some of these music contract pieces. Yeah, well, that's... nobody hears them ever again. I've destroyed them all. So you're probably the only living person. The copy? <laughs> Seriously. Well, maybe I'll post it at the end of the interview. Please don't do that. <laughs> I was just thinking that Sylvester and Tweety thing, that must have been one of the older ones that was just like too harsh and that they they never, you never saw that on like Saturday morning cartoons, beat him to a pulp, swallowed him. That was too graphic. <laughs> well, I don't know. I mean, you know, we saw pretty uh, violent things as Gen X kids. I, <laughs> it, it didn't seem to shock anybody at the time. Yeah. 